Ryan Thomas at East West here, and welcome to the third session in our East West Academy series, which takes you through every aspect of music production from beginning to end in super granular detail. Now, this is actually one of a two-part series on orchestration. And in this one, we're gonna talk primarily about the roles that each instrument tends to play in the orchestra, just to kind of get you familiar with those. And then in the second part of this series, we're going to cover things like instrument doublings, chord voicings, and of course, texture and movement. Now, many of the contextual examples that we'll be using are actually from the piece you're hearing right now, which you can also hear at the end of this video if you're interested. So let's go ahead and dive right in, starting with the strings. So in order to become a great composer, you have to listen to great composers. And of course, the same is true if you wanna be an effective orchestrator. Now, you'll notice when you listen to your favorite composers that they are going to use different instruments differently. That's part of what makes them unique. But you'll also notice that the various instrument groups do tend to fill a somewhat consistent set of roles. Now, I do want to caution you not to take anything that we're gonna be talking about in this video as a rule. These are all just gonna be some general guidelines to help get you started. So let's go ahead and begin with the strings. And of course, part of what makes the orchestral strings unique is the fact that these are bowed instruments. And that means they don't have to breathe. They don't have to take breaks. And that's going to affect the way that you use them when you're orchestrating. So if I want some crazy runs at the beginning of a piece and I need them to extend through a large number of measures, of course, I'm going to probably reach for the violins. So this is gonna be a great use for your violins. Now that of course would be a difficult line to play for a real violin section, but it is perfectly doable. Now violins also of course excel on melody just due to their tonal characteristics. And we did also have the second violins actually doubling the first violins here until right around measure 59 when they broke off into a harmony. Then I also wanted to check out the violin melody at measure 122. And I should point out that here I'm actually using a patch from Hollywood Fantasy Orchestra. And typically when you have violins on melody and you need a lot of power, you will double violin one and violin two in octaves. So violin one is gonna be on that top octave, Violin two is gonna be on the bottom. But here we had just a little bit of a twist on that in this particular patch. You've actually got violins on the top and then violas in that second lower octave. So it's just a little bit of a twist on that concept. So here they are at measure 122. So violins can also sound quite powerful if you're using them effectively. And of course, violins, as well as most bowed string instruments, are going to excel at these ostinato lines. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's basically a repeated pattern, usually consisting of short notes like staccatos, spiccatos, and staccatissimos. So let's go ahead and check out this passage. I'm gonna solo the violins first. And then here they are in context. And we'll talk more about ostinatos when we cover movement and texture. That's gonna be in part two of the orchestration series. Now, of course, violins can also play these support roles. So here they're helping to kind of give us the chord while the celli and the solo French horn take the melody. Mm -hmm. 
Now there, I was just using regular sustains with the Con Sordino mode engaged. Now, if that needed to be a little bit more delicate, you could also use the Sultasto Flautando. That's just absolutely gorgeous. So obviously violins can just play a massive number of roles in the orchestra. Now, you violists are going to hate me for this, but violas do tend to play a bit more of a support role. So here they are playing this ostinato line while the violins and the celli pass this melody back and forth. So here are the violas by themselves. and then here they are in context. And in my experience, I think violas tend to have just a slightly softer attack than both the celli and the violins. So that's gonna make them ideal for passages like this. And here's what they're doing in context. So again, in my experience, I think violas tend to excel when you need those slightly more delicate short articulations, especially in that alto range where I think violins again, in general, are just going to give you slightly harsher transients. And then of course, violas are gonna be ideal for supporting the chord because they are relatively unobtrusive. So here they are in this passage and I'm just gonna solo the strings. But then, of course, in the right context, violas can sound really cool on melody. So here they are again in this high strings patch from Hollywood Fantasy Strings. So I think those violas really do give that bottom note in the octave a bit more gravitas than the second violins would have given it. So again, it just really depends on how you wanna use these. Now the cello is probably my favorite of the bowed stringed instruments. It's gonna be massively versatile. It excels both at leading and support roles. So here it is on melody. And then here they are playing some really chunky ostinatos and the celli have these beautiful pronounced transients. And here they are in context. And then of course, celli are often used to play the all important bass note of the chord. And they are often doubled by the string basses in octave below. So here they are by themselves. And then in context. Now, the basses, much like the violas, are going to play a bit more of a support role. However, because they are typically gonna be on the bottom in a typical chord structure, they're going to play an outsized role in defining that chord. Now, that said, basses, I think, do have a bit of a more nasal sound in the higher register.
So again, just a little bit nasal, and I find them to be slightly weaker just tonally than, say, the celli would be in that same range. So I think unless you're going for a specific effect or you just like the timbre of the basses in that higher range for whatever reason, I would try to keep the basses in the meat of their range. And of course, in the right context, being used effectively, basses can sound absolutely amazing playing a melody. So here they are with the celli. And if you need the low end warmth of the string basses, but want to keep things light, bass pizzicato is of course never a bad choice. Now of course there's so much more that the strings can do. You've got tremolo, you've got various effects and sort of extended articulations, but we're gonna talk a bit more about those in the next video when we talk about textures and movement. So for now, let's go ahead and move on to the brass. Now, of course, brass is gonna have a radically different philosophy of use from the strings. Number one, players have to breathe. Number two, they can't stay on high notes for extended periods of time. And then, of course, brass does tend to have a much bolder, edgier sound at the higher dynamics. So because of all these considerations, you have to be really careful with your phrasing when writing for brass. So if you notice, the brass is actually resting for quite a bit of this piece. And of course, part of that is just because of the basic principle that you don't want every instrument playing all the time because it gets very boring. You need to switch up your colors, switch up who's on melody, switch up who's supporting the melody. So let's talk about the trumpets. I think these are a great way to turn up the heat on a section that really needs to pop. So you'll notice that around halfway through measure 13, you've got the brass section coming in on this passage. And then the trumpets are only joining them in measures 16 and the beginning of 17. So let's hear the effect that the trumpets have on this part. And now let's hear them in context. So by keeping those trumpets in reserve for just those last couple bars, it makes that build up much more effective. You get much more of a crescendo. And of course, trumpets are going to be ideal for melody, especially when you really need it to pop or to cut through a denser orchestration. Now, trumpets can also play a support role and add some really exciting texture, like in this passage. So the trumpets there were just infusing that section with so much more energy than it otherwise would have had. And that's one of the main things that trumpets really excel at. Now we could do almost an entire video series on writing for French horns alone. These are just massively versatile. And at the beginning, they are basically giving us the chordal and rhythmic foundation for this intro. And I should note that they do tend to sound really good in these closed chord voicings. They're really closed in this case. We'll get more into that in the second part of this series. So here they are by themselves. And 
And I really like using that two French horn key switch patch. It's just got a really clean, punchy sound, and it allows you to write these big stacked chords without the French horn section sounding so much larger than a real section would sound because it's only two French horns per note. It would still be a fairly large French horn section. It would be eight players technically, if you really wanna get into the weeds. But uh, all that to say, this patch is really beautiful for this kind of writing. So now let's hear these in context. So another ideal use for the French horn section is going to be counter melody and movement. So in this particular phrase, they're coming in around measure 39 on a counter melody, and then they're joining up with the high strings on melody around 41. So we'll start a little bit out from that so you can have some context. And of course, French horns make ideal lead instruments. Now, the low brass, and that's going to include your trombones, bass trombones, tubas, cymbasos, and whatever other low brass instruments you happen to be working with, is usually going to be taking a support role. Now, just like anything, you can use them however you want to, as long as you're intentional about what you're doing. But again, they tend to take support roles. They can be really ideal for adding more bite to low string shorts if what you have with the strings isn't quite cutting it. And let's hear this section without the low brass just to hear the contrast. So as you could tell, we lost a lot there. Now, low brass is also going to be ideal for supporting that chord while other instruments add color and movement. So again, if you just need something there to provide some support for the chord, that low brass is a really effective way to do that. Now, low brass is also going to be ideal when you just need some really punchy low end. That's why you'll often hear it in action sequences. And at 93, it's actually taking the melody. So listen for when that happens. And then at measure 101, you can hear the incredible energy that the low brass is bringing here. So if we had just had, say, the low strings on that descending arpeggio in that last measure, it just wouldn't have cut it. You needed the punchiness of that low brass. So it's really ideal for those kinds of applications. So in general, low brass is going to help you fill things out. It's also gonna give you some punchiness and some energy, but then high brass is going to give you a lot more edge and a different kind of energy. And they're both incredibly useful, but be sure again to watch your phrasing. Be careful how and when you use these. Don't overuse them, save them for when you need the maximum emotional impact. Now, woodwinds, I think, are notoriously difficult to write for. They're often misused or they're just not used at all because they are very delicate, so they can get lost in a mix very easily if you're not very intentional about how you use them. So with woodwinds, you have to consider phrasing, again, because these rely on the breath of the player, and you also have to very carefully consider where they're sitting in the orchestration so they don't get buried by other instruments. And register is going to play a huge role when you are writing for woodwinds. But in general, I would say that they tend to be the icing on the cake. They are really the masters of color. So they're ideal for things like runs and trills, and they're great for doubling with, say, a violin melody that just needs more color and texture to it. 
Now, woodwinds are going to do fine on melody as long as you're paying attention to your registers. So the lowest octave of this melody is being played by the oboe, and the woodwinds are being supported by the violins and the viola shorts, and you'll notice that the lowest note in the melody is coinciding with the highest note that's being played by the violins and violas. So basically, the violins and violas are staying out of the way of the woodwinds in terms of register crossover. So let's go ahead and hear how this sounds. So again, because we have the strings and the woodwinds operating in those different registers, you're going to be able to hear the woodwinds clearly enough for that passage to work. Then when the low woodwinds and the English horn take over the melody, we are transitioning the strings to some pizzicatos, so they're gonna be even less obtrusive in the mix. And some of the woodwinds are then playing that chord. And you'll notice that the bass clarinet here is mostly below the instruments that are supporting that chord there. So even there, I think it could have benefited from having even more separation between the registers of the supporting instruments and the woodwinds that were playing the melody there. But it's a good illustration of why you need to be very intentional when you are writing with woodwinds. Now, woodwinds are also ideal for just adding some subtle texture and movement to a passage that just needs a little bit more color. So here at 79, let's hear what the woodwinds are doing by themselves. And right now we just have the flutes and clarinets playing. And then let's hear them in context. And then we had that oboe coming in just to add a little bit of counter melody there at the end. And then of course, woodwinds are gonna be ideal for doubling with other instruments just to add some extra spice to the sound and we'll get more into how to do that effectively in the second video on orchestration. But here, the high woodwinds are doubling the high strings, the low woodwinds are doubling the low strings, and then you actually have this piccolo doubling the trumpet solo. It's a bit of a wonky doubling, but it happened to work for this section, so I just went with it. So here are the woodwinds by themselves. and then here they are in context. And woodwinds are going to be ideal for runs, either with or without the strings. And Hollywood orchestral woodwinds includes so many articulations. So you've actually got three articulations dedicated specifically to runs. So you can really get maximal realism with these patches. And woodwinds are also ideal for playing trills, which can add just a lot of excitement and energy to a passage. And listen to how much is lost when we mute the woodwinds here. So as you could hear, it just lost a lot of energy and excitement. Now virtually all woodwinds are going to excel as solo instruments. Which one you pick for that particular solo is just gonna depend on the flavor that you want for that line. So, you know, oboes can sound very playful, but also very emotional. Clarinets can actually sound a little bit sad and flutes can sound sort of magical and mysterious, so on and so forth. Just be careful to create enough space in your orchestration for the soloist to be heard clearly. So here is just one example. So again, woodwinds are just ideal for adding color and texture, but they can also be really emotionally compelling as a lead instrument in the right context. Now percussion is of course going to give you a ton of color, it's gonna give you a ton of texture, but very crucially, it's going to give you rhythmic definition. So you can either use it 
to set up a rhythmic backbone for a section like at 103. Or you can also just use it to add some more punch and definition to a passage. So here the timpani is actually following the low brass line and it's just giving it a lot more energy than it otherwise would have had. Now you can also do something similar with the higher tuned percussion like xylophone and glockenspiel to help clarify melody lines that might again just need a little bit more definition. So here you've got the xylophone that is actually doubling the woodwinds on melody. They just bring a lot more clarity. And then we're doing the same thing with the glockenspiel at measure 22. And that's also helping that woodwind line to just speak a little bit more clearly in the mix. Now you can also use high tuned percussion to fill sonic space in a very interesting and subtle way. And it also usually has the effect of sounding very magical. So here is the Celesta Crotales Ensemble from Hollywood Fantasy Percussion and the harp at measure 37. And now let's hear what it's doing in context. So again, you're not really hearing it clearly, but it is filling the space and it's making this section just feel and sound a lot more magical. Now the harp, which is both a stringed as well as percussion instrument, can fill a variety of different roles. It's being used a lot in this piece, as you can see. Sometimes it's felt a little bit more than it's heard, but because it offers more percussive transients, it's often used to help add rhythmic definition and color like at 69. So here it's almost being used like a piano. So harp obviously makes a great accompaniment instrument, but it's quite a bit more subtle and less obtrusive than piano. And of course, harp can play these glisses, which makes it fairly unique in the orchestra. And it just adds so much energy and color in this section. And then you can see at 37, it became an accompaniment instrument again. Then you can just do some really fun and creative stuff with percussion, like the chime in this passage. It's adding so much in this section. That orchestral bell ensemble from Hollywood Fantasy Orchestra just adds such an incredible presence in that section. Now, I know that we touched on some other concepts in orchestration in this video, but I really wanted to save the bulk of those discussions for part two of the orchestration series, which is of course part of the broader East West Academy series. Now, if you want to hear the piece that we've been pulling excerpts from in this video in its entirety, then just stick around for the end of this video and we'll just play the entire thing out. Otherwise, if you liked this video, don't forget to like it, drop a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any future content. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Now here's that piece.